so how many of you are, are movie people? You like to watch movies or, or maybe TV shows. Um, any kind of motion picture story. Um, I, I love movies. I'm a movie buff. I grew up watching lots of movies and probably too many movies because I didn't get as much done as I probably could have back when I had homework. Um, but I love movies and I love a good like closure to the end of a story. How many of you, because uh, there's, 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 I'm not talking about cliffhangers when there's like a next episode, but there's different levels to which a movie gets resolved. Like uh, you, you get movies like the Pirates of the Caribbean, right? If you, if you, uh, if you guys seen Pirates of the Caribbean, like the original one, um, where, you know, at the very end, you know, well, Will and Elizabeth get together, they, they get the magical moment where the, 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 the troubles are, are done, they, they, get, they get together and Jack Sparrow jumps off the ledge and gets to go to it. Well, I'll just show you the clip r real quick right here. The Black Pearl is yours. On deck, you scabrous dogs! Hands for braces! Let go and hold to run free! Now, bring me that horizon. And really bad eggs. Drink up, me hearty Joe-ho! All right, so this makes me want to go rewatch those movies. But you get to that point where, where, like, the whole movie, Jack Sparrow's just been trying to get his dang boat back because he was mutinied by his crew, right? And then the end of the movie, you know, the guy gets the girl, and then he gets his ship back. And he gets to head out into the open seas, perfect closure to the story and the tension it has been building this whole movie. And then the end, it's resolved, and it's on to happily ever after, onto the horizon, right? But that's, that's one way a movie can end. Another, mo uh, one, another way a movie can end is, have you guys seen Inception? Okay, just a brief synopsis. It's like, it's, it gets really trippy and deep because Christopher Nolan. But it's basically like the whole goal is to plant ideas, uh, dreams within a dream. And, and, and like you go so many layers deep into dreams in order to influence people and, and then get out. But this whole time, the main character has been trying to get home to his family. Okay. So, so check out how this movie ends and I'll explain it in a second. They're waking up from their sleep. Their mission is complete and they're heading home. Mr. Cobb. Thank you, sir. Okay. 
Okay, so the contrast between the two. You get Pirates of the Caribbean, where he's that final image of the movie. He's, he's got his boat back. He's looking off to the horizon. The, the tension has been resolved. There's closure. You understand everything that happens, and it's nothing but clear skies ahead. And then you get to Inception, where this whole movie, he's been trying to get to his family. And he's been stuck inside these dreams. And he's been doing the work. And then he finally gets to the end of the movie. And this is how he knew how he stayed sane throughout the whole time. If his top kept spinning, he was still inside the dream. But if the, if the top toppled over, because he did so, many, so, uh, so much dream diving, that if the top toppled over, it meant he was in reality. He was in the real world. That was how he knew whether or not he was still dreaming. At the end of the movie, he finally gets to his family. You think there's closure. You think there's resolve. But then in the final frames of the movie, you don't see if the top topples over or if it's, you don't know if he's still dreaming or if he's actually been with his family, if he actually completed his, his goal. So you don't know if that tension was resolved. There's mystery at the end of the movie. If you've not seen it, it's really trippy, but super good. I recommend you go watch that movie. But it, it's, it's called Inception. But it's uh, like even like over a decade later, people still have debates as to whether or not he was dreaming or he was with his family. So there's these two different ways that you can interpret it. There's, there's, there's those endings that there's no questions asked. Every loop was closed and you get to move on with your life. And there's other stories that leaves with a little mystery and you get to come up with the ending for yourself, what you think happens. How many of you like the give me the full resolve and the closure? How many of you like leaving it up to interpretation and speculation? Yeah, a little bit of mixture. Depends on the movie probably, right? And so it, it's, I, I love a beautifully resolved story that doesn't answer all the questions, that leaves it up to interpretation. And then there's other times that I'm like, just tell me what happens, right? This, there's no sequel to this movie. You don't ever get to find out what happens. It's all up to you what happens. And so... Uh, there's, there's two different ways that, that you could see that it could end. And uh, the whole point of this whole series is this idea of mystery, this idea of wonder. If we don't have every answer to every question, is our faith blind? And I would pose the same question on science. If we don't have every resolve to every question that we have asked, does that mean that science is inefficient? I'll let you interpret that for yourself. But when it comes to questions about life, Faith, science, what I want you to recognize is that mystery is a part of it. We talked about this a little bit last week, and we, we quoted Einstein. Mystery is essential in life, and it's okay to not have every answer. But then, is it, is it okay to not, at what point do you not have enough answers? At what point is your faith now blind and irrational versus concrete and evidence-based? And, and so, we're, we're going to tackle some of these topics uh, throughout the series, but um, there, there are a, a couple of different tensions that maybe you feel that I know I've felt growing up, and one is the tension that we're told if we wander or ask too many questions, maybe if you grew up in church, this was implied to you uh, like it was to me, but if you ask too many questions, then uh, it means you don't have enough faith. Anybody kind of gotten that sentiment before? Don't ask that. You just don't have enough faith, right? That's one tension people feel. Um, maybe uh, other people, they feel the tension because uh, of all the questions that we have. Um, we don't always feel safe to ask. We don't always feel safe asking to get the answers because uh, it feels like you have to pick a side, pick a team, team faith or team science. I always think of the Nacho Libre uh, guy, I only believe in science. Like, like it feels like you have to choose one or the other. Maybe you feel that tension or maybe we feel the tension because people tell us we should feel tension, but honestly we don't, Right? I find a lot more people from your generation feel that, that maybe like, should I feel attention? The reality is you should feel it because there are others who feel it. And then you should dig into some questions and come up with some answers for yourself that you can, uh, you can determine has enough resolve for your own faith. But the point is you need to get into some of the questions yourself that people are asking, not only so that you can know, but so that you can help others who have those questions. Because I think a lot of people leave the faith unnecessarily because they've been told a false dichotomy that they have to believe a certain thing or not a certain thing in order to have faith. And in that, we miss what really matters. So um, faith, we decided last week, faith is a confidence in who God is, and that informs the way we live. 
Uh, we talked about that last week. If we're going to define faith, we don't mean it's a blind faith. It's a fairy tale. It's a once upon a time, and you choose to believe it or not. We believe it's evidence-based. Based, there's reasons for us to have a certain level of certainty when it comes to aspects of our faith. But faith is a confidence in who God is and how that informs the way we live. Uh, and it makes sense that, that we would feel some of the tension around this topic. Um, you know, because we, we, whether it's things that we hear in science class or things that we hear on social media or in movies or on TV, um, we're, we're presented with science-based explanations to things all the time, right? You, you hear maybe uh, people on TikTok or fitness influencers. Anybody follow those kind of people? Like that, that will talk about stuff and they'll talk about diets, how they can improve your muscle mass and, and all this kind of stuff. There's biology in that, by the way. Um, there's weather reporters and activists talking about the climate. There's climatology, right? There's, there's tech companies or, uh, for social platforms that are changing their algorithms or are making self-driving cars or something. There's technology science behind that. There's space travel, astronomy. There's cryptocurrency and NFTs, which is computer science. Like, there's all kinds of fields of science that affect us in our everyday lives. So is that a different world than the world where we have faith? Are those two things separate in any way? And, and, and the reality is that's, well, well, well let's keep going. That is a science and, uh, and maybe, maybe we hear questions we found ourselves asking, or you've heard people ask the questions, if there was a worldwide flood, why do some experts seem to say maybe not? Why do energy, crystals, and other forms, uh, other things that fall somewhere in between science and faith seem to be, like, trending right now? Th this idea of energies and vibes and crystals, like, that's, that's the thing. Anybody gone down those rabbit trails before? Like, that shows up on my feeds once in a while. Does evolutionary theory prove that God didn't create everything the way that Genesis says? Do I have to pick between having more faith or taking anxiety medicine? Right? These are tensions that we often feel. There's lots of strong opinions about things, but where do we draw the line between what's okay and not okay when you live in a world of faith and science? How do you balance the two and reconcile them so they work together? Honestly, we keep going. You've got science, medicine, faith in the Bible, faith in who God says he is. All these things go together in something that we all wonder about, or at least we should from time to time. So maybe the better question is where do we go with our questions? You guys felt that tension? Because you could find the answer to anything you want online, whether it's right or wrong. You can find people who will say whatever suits your confirmation bias, what you want to be true, you can find that and use that as your own evidence. So see, this person says it. But then you'll find other people with different sources that say different things. So where do we go for our questions? You get into a lot of rabbit holes there. But maybe most of all, we wonder, do I have to shut down my brain in order to believe in God? And do I have to shut down my faith to believe in science? These are real tensions that people wrestle with every single day. So uh, these questions aren't new. They're not something to be scared of. They're, they're something that we can have answers to. There's certain things that, like the end of Inception, you will have mystery involved. But it doesn't have to destroy your faith. So let's break down what, uh, something that Paul said. He's one of the early Christian leaders who went around teaching about Jesus, his experience with them, and what that meant for people. And he said this in Colossians chapter 1. He said, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, generally, Christians have always believed what Paul is describing here, and that is that Jesus is actually God in human form, right? In Jesus, the whole world was created. You go back to Genesis that we talked about last week. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we said this last week, but it's worth mentioning again. The, pur the purpose of Genesis is not to describe how things were created, but who was behind it. God created. That doesn't answer the debates that can go on about creation versus evolution, although that, that, that can come up and we can have those discussions. That's not the purpose of Genesis. 
the purpose is who is behind it. And in Jesus, the whole world was created. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And down in verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. He's talking again about Jesus. Jesus has always been there. And, uh, and since He's God, and He created our laws of time and space, He sits outside of that. He's not bound by our laws of time and space. So for us to, to wrap our minds around the idea that there was never a beginning for God, God just was. There was a beginning for us because we're bound by time, but he is not. He stands outside of time. So our, our brains have a hard time wrapping ourselves around that, but the reality is Jesus has always been there. He's been there in the beginning. And Jesus is just God in human form. But our faith is not built on on the theories about creation versus evolution or, or anything like that. It's not built on whether or not there was a worldwide flood. It's not built on the idea that there was a real person named Jonah, Jonah who was swallowed by a whale and survived for three days before God told the whale to spit him out on shore to go do what he was called to do. Our faith isn't built on those things. Well, if you give me an eight-week course where I can sit here and explain everything step by step by step, I can prove to you why I think that's still perfectly fine to accept and believe to this day. I don't have that kind of time with you. So instead, I, want, I'm not, I don't want to teach you what to think, but how to think about these things. And we're, we're going to kind of close loop, resolve this a little bit more next week. But for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. But what I want you to recognize is our faith is built on a person, Jesus, who we believe is the Son of God and who is behind all scientific understanding. In other words, all those questions about the Old Testament, all those questions about the miraculous things that happen. By the way, that, just a little tidbit. Uh, I was talking to Missy earlier. She said there's a new thing on National Geographic on Disney where this guy goes in and actually talks about like, some of these Old Testament stories and geographically how they could be true. It's really cool, like infrared on drones and stuff. I haven't seen it, but she's just telling me about that. It goes right along with what we're talking about. Now, you can go home and watch that tonight. I, I probably will, actually, because that kind of stuff intrigues me. But there's, there's evidence all around if you know where to look. But our faith is not built on any of those things. It's built on the person of Jesus. And this is really where we're going to resolve this next week. So if you, if you miss anything, if you, if you can't make it next week, watch it on YouTube. I encourage you to come back next week because that's really the most important part of this series. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, I encourage you to do that because we're going to be releasing some content over the next couple of weeks about some of these questions about science and faith that we haven't had time to get into from the stage here because of our, our time limitations, but you can trust someone before you know everything, right? You can trust someone before you know everything. Um, this is something that, that Galileo said. He was a, a famous Italian scientist that lived in the 1600s. Um, he invented the telescope. Uh, he was the person who first recognized that the, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, but we actually revolve around the sun which seems to conflict with something the psalmist says in the Old Testament. So back then in the 1600s, people were like, no, you're anti-God, anti-faith by following your science because that contradicts what's in the Bible. They had these debates back then too, which again, you have to recognize what genre you're in. Psalm, psalms is poetry. It's not, again, a story of how things happen, but it's painting a picture of who God is and who we are in relation to him. So you got to read it a little differently, but that's the argument Galileo made. Here's, here's what he said. He famously said, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with senses, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. In other words, I don't have to check my brain at the door to see how God has created things to work. And by coming to a better understanding of how things work in this world, I don't have to diminish my faith. Again, because our faith is not built on those understandings of the world, but on who Jesus is. Uh, in fact, speaking of, of our brains, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 22. It says, uh, he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So our faith is built on a person, and that is Jesus. And really, that's where we start. Those other things, we can get into the weeds. We can discuss them. We can believe differently about some of those things and still believe in the same God. Those things don't have to tear apart your faith. And you can have confidence in your faith because of the person of Jesus. Again, we're going to dive really deep into that concept next week. 
But what challenges our faith doesn't have to destroy our faith. This tension or discomfort we feel doesn't have to be a disaster for us. Think about it this way. What if I were to give you free tickets to jump on a plane and go to Hawaii this week? Would that be pretty legit? How many of you would be stoked about that? Go, go. I'm going to give you free tickets to go to Hawaii. Now, keep your hands up. If you know the scientific explanation of how planes work and what all the buttons on the controls do in order to get you from here to there. Some of you probably have a vague overview of how that works, but I bet very few of you are, you know, like airplane engineers and can understand all of that to the depth that it would take to actually get us from here to there if you're going to get behind the wheel of a plane, right? Does that mean you don't believe in science because you don't understand it? Does that, be- that doesn't diminish that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, turning down a flight to a dream vacation because you don't understand how the process of flight works. When you get on a plane, you're not putting your faith in how planes work. What are you putting your faith in? You're putting your faith in the pilot, that he knows what he's doing to get you from point A to point B. Okay? The same is true as we live and interact with our world today. Right? We don't have to fully understand how everything works, although it's cool if we do. We don't have to. What we have to trust is the pilot in charge of everything. And that's Jesus, who is there before all things and who is behind all things. All things were created by him and for him. And if we have faith in him, the hows in between can figure themselves out. And it doesn't have to wreak havoc on our faith. So you don't have to know everything in order to trust someone. And as Christians, we believe that someone is Jesus. So, one, you should ask questions. Questions are great. Questions help you learn. Questions help you dive into the different realities of our world. It will expand your mind, and that is a good thing. We don't have to be afraid of that. Two, you can trust Jesus. We're going to talk about why specifically you can trust him next week and how that doesn't make you a uh, fairy tale believing nonsensical person who checks your brain at the door. There's actual reason to have faith. So uh, maybe everything we've talked about today sounds good to you, uh, but you still have questions. Why Jesus should be trusted. Maybe you've had life experience that shows you otherwise. Maybe you've known people who trusted Jesus who didn't represent him very well. For that, I'm sorry. Humans are imperfect. But we're going to talk about why he is actually trustworthy and why he is the foundation of our faith above any of these other questions. While all these other questions are encouraged and good, that's not where our faith begins or ends. So, what would change if your faith was built on the person of Jesus rather than the need to know everything? What would that look for your life? Let me pray. We'll go into our small groups briefly, um, and then pretty much you just have time for prayer requests and uh, to wrap up this evening. And then next week, please come back as we wrap up the series. Um, Tune in on YouTube. Subscribe to us if you haven't so that you can get some of the extra information that we're not able to cover in these kinds of things. All right.